everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for day four of our Inclusive Excellence Week um, here at the School of Dentistry. I'm super excited. We have a faculty um, over from the School of Medicine joining us today uh, to specifically address uh, inclusive inclusivity of all, improving care for our LGBTIQ plus patients, uh, Dr. Steve Crossman. And so I'll allow him to take it from here. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, thank you for having me. It's um, looking at the lineup. I feel very um, humbled to be uh, talking about this issue uh, during this week with, with everyone. And uh, hopefully it'll um, provide some uh, some good uh, starting points for some conversations. And if there are uh, questions, I understand that I have some help from some friends in dentistry for the, the chat function, that'd be great. Um, feel free to, to interrupt at any time. Uh, I do wanna talk about uh, what I hope we'll spend most of the time discussing, uh, objectives being uh, that folks can define and discuss uh, four main constructs, uh, biological sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, and gender expression by the end of the session, and um, describe and talk uh, at least about a couple specific things that we can do as clinicians and um, uh, with our teams in the clinical arena to hopefully help improve care for our LGBT IQ patients. Want to talk about me first. Uh, so Again, thank you for having me. My name is Steve Crossman. I'm a family physician. Uh, I'm a family doc. I work here at VCU. I am in the Department of Family Medicine and Population Health. I spend um, you know, about a third of my time in the clinic seeing patients, uh, often with learners. Uh, I spend about 50% um, of my time doing more teaching and administration. Um, and then the rest is kind of a, a mishmash of uh, service and, and other stuff. Um, I am a uh, cisgender, uh, white, gay male, and we'll talk a little bit about those words as well, if some of them uh, might be unfamiliar. I think it, um, at least when I talk to the students and have talked to others uh, about this topic, uh, um, the timeline uh, has seemed a, a little bit helpful and also um, opens up uh, you know, to you all, um, a, a lot that I'm more than happy to take questions uh, privately, personally, uh, about the issues here in terms of uh, my experience, um, and uh, certainly uh, highlight some of the, the key historical issues that have affected um, at least um, the, the homosexual population over time. So if we go all the way back in time, uh, 1935, Freud asserted that homosexuality was not a vice or illness that um, unfortunately did not uh, stick. And up until 1973, homosexuality was considered uh, a mental disorder uh, in the DSM Diagnostic Statistics Manual. Um, in 1967, um, this particular case was a Canadian who was deported uh, for being a uh, deviant um, uh, based on his homosexuality. Uh, for those of us who are um, a little bit on the older side of the population, 1969 is generally considered the uh, beginning of the gay rights movement within this country, and I was born. Um, so that uh, year is special for multiple reasons. Um, again, uh, we look at DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act was signed into law in 96, about the time I graduated medical school. Um, there's a couple other cases to, to highlight here. One is Lawrence v. Texas. That was the Supreme Court case in 2003 that um, finished uh, overturning sodomy laws within the United States. There are, um, at that time, there were still multiple states that had uh, sodomy laws uh, on the books. Some of them were uh, homosexual specific and others were both for homosexual and heterosexual um, uh, interactions. Uh, 2009, I was married. Unfortunately, that marriage uh, did not mean anything in Virginia until um, uh, much later. Um, you can uh, remember in 2013 was the, the first uh, big step towards marriage equality. 
U.S. v. Windsor Supreme Court decision, and then in 2014, uh, kind of the final uh, step where uh, my husband was able to get benefits uh, in recognition of our marriage. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, he was not, um, and so was engaged in the, the private healthcare insurance marketplace um, at that time. Uh, my family, we have uh, two daughters, um, uh, born in 09 in 2015. So from a personal perspective, as society and, and medical um, precedents were changing, that's kind of what was going on for me. Um, clinically speaking, and I'm doing the slides wrong, sorry. There uh, were especially some uh, clinically relevant dates um, uh, GRID, gay-related immune deficiency, was recognized in 1982. Um, the first HIV blood test was in 85, and the first antiretroviral uh, came on board in 1987. So uh, when I was in medical school in the early 90s, uh, and then in residency, it was really um, kind of smack in the middle of uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, okay. So again, that was a little bit about me. Um, I wanted to do uh, a couple of recent headlines. So let's come fast forward to the year 2020 and a couple of things that happened this summer uh, that are, uh, I believe, relevant. Um, one was that the Department of Health and Human Services um, issued uh, a ruling that had reversed uh, 2016 uh, change in approach, and then there was a Supreme Court ruling this summer a few days later uh, that also looked at the issue of uh, sex and sex-based sex discrimination. So uh, when it comes to the Health and Human Services in 2016, uh, the administration uh, changed its interpretation of sex discrimination to uh, include in its definition uh, termination of pregnancy and gender identity um, however, uh, the courts uh, subsequently ruled that um, this was uh, not lawful and uh, this summer uh, they officially, Health and Human Services went back to uh, its official uh, interpretation of sex as meaning um, sex defined by biology. Interestingly, a few days later, uh, June 15th, 2015, the Supreme Court uh, held that employment-based discrimination um, based on sex had to include um, issues related to sexual orientation and uh, gender identity, uh, saying that there was no escaping the role that the intent plays uh, and that uh, discrimination based on homosexuality or transgender uh, status was uh, by definition uh, relying on sex and therefore uh, was prohibited. So Interestingly, if, if this ruling would have come out a few days early, it's, it's possible that Health and Human Services might have interpreted their action a little bit differently. So what this means is that um, I'm no longer risking my employment by coming out to you all as gay um, as of a few months ago. Um, so I was glad of, of that ruling as it came out. This is a slide that uh, I like to use to remind myself of kind of where we are and what we're talking about. Um, in, the, in the center of this big gold star represents uh, where, all of, where all of the magic happens, where all of the action is in terms of our clinical relationships that we engage in with patients. Uh, and those of course uh, happen within a system. So the patients bring in their um, their full range of life experience and culture, as do we as the clinicians. And then those interactions happen, uh, whether it's in um, Jamaica with the dental clinic project there, dental school project there, whether it's in uh, the clinic uh, here in Richmond or, or other sites, um, that location and that system uh, definitely plays an impact on our relationships. Um, and um, and uh, the clinical outcomes as well. Again, just a few more kind of grounding uh, pieces, culture, as we think about cultural competency, cultural humility, and going through talking about how we can enhance and improve our relations and interactions with others. Remember that 
uh, culture is both shared. We share cultural attributes with others and uh, culture is unique. Um, we all have an individual culture of one. Um, culture is heritable. It's uh, passed down from generation to generation and it's contagious. Um, our cultures of association as we grow um, enhance, uh, modify, change uh, our individual cultures uh, by interacting with that heritable component, our cultures of origin. Anytime I'm talking about uh, groups of people, I also want to highlight a, a couple of things. The first is intra-cultural um, variations. So there are six initials in the talk today, the LGBT plus the I and Q, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and uh, the Q sometimes means questioning versus queer. So remember too that this is an unbelievably diverse group of folks. Um, and if we look at just a few of the different factors, uh, even within that G letter, uh, which is where, where I live, uh, differences in generation, uh, before or after gay rights, differences in relationship status, family status, children, uh, differences in the coming out experiences. Then of course, intersectionality uh, with potential other um, minority status, uh, whether it's race or religion based. Again, uh, looking at the transgender uh, population, uh, highly variable, uh, reminding us that all individuals uh, really do need to be uh, treated as such and that uh, we always have to be mindful of the uh, challenges of um, employing uh, generalizations where they help improve our clinical care, uh, but not uh, making judgments um, or, or succumbing to stereotypes. All right, so a couple of brief terms or abbreviations that folks might not have seen. And uh, I wanna start with uh, cis. So when you hear someone refer to themselves as I did as cisgender, it basically means that there is an alignment in accordance of matching of my biological sex, sexual uh, sex, sex assigned at birth with my gender identity. Uh, contrasting that to trans, trans meaning cross or across, uh, folks who identify as trans uh, generally have um, a, uh, a, a distinction uh, or a difference between uh, the gender identity or brain sex and the biological sex or sex assigned at birth. TGNC uh, is a broader, more inclusive phrase referring to the transgender and gender non-conforming community. Um, many folks uh, who don't necessarily identify as trans also don't identify with the traditional gender norms of, of maleness and femaleness. Um, within our uh, medical practice, CSHT or GAHT typically refers to cross-sex uh, hormone therapy or gender affirming hormone therapy. And, some of those initials or, or pieces may come up as we go on. And again, if there are questions or comments, um, please don't hesitate to throw them out um, into the chat uh, and we'll, I'll do my best to, to address them as we go. I do have three major uh, take homes that I, I hope people will have. One is uh, the concept of cultural humility. Um, it is impossible for any one of us to be uh, thoroughly competent in every different culture that we will encounter, uh, focusing on the um, humility aspects of our relationships with others, um, the questioning, the curiosity, the learning that goes on when we uh, interact with folks who are different than we are is, is pretty critical. So the four main uh, kind of constructs I talked about in the objectives, gender identity, gender expression, biological sex, and sexual orientation. Uh, this one slide, I, I think really does hit on um, some, some very important um, concepts and I'll, I'll walk through them a little bit using again, myself as the example. So my brain sex, my gender identity, who my head tells me that I am is a man. So my gender identity, uh, my brain sex is another uh, way that it's often phrased is male. 
uh, or masculine. My uh, biological sex, the sex that I was assigned at birth, the doctor delivered me and said to my parents, it's a boy uh, based on uh, the external genitalia that I as a baby presented to the world. Uh, so that biological sex um, presumably matches my chromosomes. I, I don't believe I've ever had the need to have genetic testing, but uh, my assumption is that I would uh, have uh, male XY chromosomes that, that match that and that um, matches my gender identity. So hence uh, the cis part when I said I'm a cisgender um, white gay male. Gender expression varies, right? So when I'm in my pajamas dancing around my house singing show tunes at the top of my lungs, that gender expression uh, might not be as traditionally masculine as, as folks uh, might expect or might be used to. Um, so uh, gender expression, uh, I would say, although, you know, I'm wearing a certain tie, um, you know, maybe I'm somewhere between androgynous and masculine. I, I do talk a lot with my hands if I'm in person uh, and maybe have other traits that might uh, in general uh, be considered uh, less masculine, but somewhere on that scale uh, towards the right. My sexual orientation, I've already uh, confided with you all, shared that uh, I am gay, so I am uh, romantically uh, attracted to, to other uh, men. And um, that's um, how I've uh, built my emotional romantic attachments um, uh, as an adult is uh, with other men. So I'm gonna stop there and take a breath. And uh, again, wanna, wanna make sure that folks are clear on this and clear on the differences and clear that this truly is um, on each of these constructs representing um, a, a range and a scale and it is not, um, not binary, right? It's not on or off, it's not male or female, um, it's not, um, woman, man, it really is in the normal course of, of our human experience. Um, these constructs are experienced on, on a range um, across the spectrum, um, whereas it, it may feel and it may be very binary for an individual person as we look at all of us collectively together, it is, it is very much not on a binary. And often there are questions that that come up or clarifications at this section. So um, Chase, I'm assuming that the, the chat is, is okay for now. Yes, none yet so far. Okay. So the second kind of key, um, key word that I like to talk about is, is the concept or, or the issue of authenticity. When we deal with, um, when I deal with patients in my clinic who, um, are uh, in sexual minority categories, whether it's based on sexual orientation or gender identity, gender expression, uh, there is this overwhelming desire for, uh, for folks, and I think we all share it, to, to be able to live authentically uh, based on who we are um, and uh, how, we, um, how we view our, um, our role in relating to others uh, around us. So, the, the cultural humility uh, going into patient interactions, the recognition that um, all of our patients um, are striving to, to be their authentic and live uh, authentic selves and live their authentic lives is uh, important to keep in mind. There is a newer version of the gingerbread person that's, that's available out on the web. Uh, this one uh, specifies a, a couple of differences. Um, one is, the idea of biological sex, uh, anatomical sex, uh, not necessarily matching sex assigned at birth. Um, as we know, there are, are definitely cases uh, where uh, the, the determination of maleness or female, femaleness at birth based on an external anatomic appearance is either inaccurate um, or unable to be, a term, uh, unable to be determined. 
There's also uh, the separation in this model of um, romantic attraction and sexual attraction. Um, but in general, it, it's the same basic concepts of identity, attraction, biological sex, and um, expression. So um, I made a pretty strong assertion that uh, what often has felt to be a very uh, binary black or white male or female uh, is, is actually an outdated paradigm that can be harmful in our, our care of patients um, if we try to apply that binary model universally. So uh, what makes me so confident in, in making that uh, strong assertion? Well, one is uh, we know biologically that um, uh, the biological sex is not binary. We, we know that there are other genetic variants that are out there. We know that there are other conditions um, that lead to um, folks being on the, uh, in the, the non-binary uh, biological uh, middle ground of, of intersex. And those are just a few of the conditions there. So uh, we also know that when it comes to gender identity and gender expression, uh, that around the world, there are gender diverse uh, gender customs. And each one of these uh, markers on this world map represents a distinct uh, cultural um, norm for a non-binary uh, third gender, uh, two-spirit or other uh, kind of similar um, um, social role and social identity. So this is um, a web link that you can get to if you want to peruse and, and kind of investigate and research some of these cultures around the world. Uh, but for um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, we've had uh, the existence of uh, third gender or uh, non-binary gender roles um, throughout uh, the breadth of, of you know, the human, human experience on the planet. This is through PBS. Um, and we can uh, maybe share the slides later, the, the uh, websites at the bottom, but if you uh, go and, and search gender diverse cultures, PBS, uh, I think this would probably pop up. Finally, uh, respect. Respect, of course, is uh, critical. Uh, in our professions is uh, helping others and being able to respect differences after we recognize them, uh, respect the positions, uh, beliefs, values that uh, folks who are other than us or different from us bring into our clinical encounters. Um, when it comes to gender identity, uh, it is also important to know that this is uh, in general uh, fixed and stable with, within uh, children by the age of five or six. Uh, so I have a five-year-old, and um, if I ask her, are you a girl or boy, um, she identifies uh, as a girl. And um, there are um, a variety of, um, excuse me, uh, there are uh, certainly uh, children um, around this age who uh, identify uh, and begin uh, kind of that uh, journey of uh, self-awareness who need uh, support. There's uh, a great program within Children's Hospital of Richmond for gender nonconforming or transgender youth. Uh, there's some amazing folks around uh, who specialize in, in helping families and children um, as, they, as they move through that journey. Just a little bit data about who the LGBT uh, population is within the states. This comes from the Williams Institute, which is an institute run out of the UCA, UCLA Law School. Uh, there are roughly 4.5% of folks in the US who identify as L LGBT. Uh, the, this map shows uh, regionally uh, where those folks are located. Um, and then when it comes to um, football, um, I just want to kind of go through some of the math and the demographics. I, I was actually preparing for this talk a couple of years ago or a similar one for the medical school. And I was driving into work and on NPR that morning, they had a story about uh, homosexual professional football players. 
And so not being a football fan, I uh, listened uh, very interestedly to that story. And then I had to come back and do some research. And, and what I found is that there's 32 professional football teams uh, in the country. Each one uh, within the NFL uh, has 46 active players on game day. Uh, maximum allowed by the league and about 35 or 40 of those are likely to play in each game. So I was thinking to myself, okay, if, if we do this math, um, how many gay pro football players are out there playing each week? And if you do the math and, and you use the, uh, the Williams Institute figure of 4.5% times 35 players times 32 teams, that uh, suggest that there would be 50 uh, gay football fields, sorry, gay football players taking the field every week. If you, um, and I'm sure that the, uh, many of the scientists in the audience are saying, well, you know, that's a very different population than the general public, Crossman, come on, you know, you can't do that. So if we say, okay, um, the, the population of uh, football players maybe is half as likely to be gay, that works out to, um, 25 uh, gay football players uh, professionally playing every week. And then there's the issue of, you know, well, let's say it's only 25% as likely within that population. You're down to about 12. At the time this story came on the radio one or two years ago, um, there were zero out gay football players professionally playing in the league. Um, and I don't follow football close enough to know if that's changed over the last few years. And there have been some out gay uh, professional football players, but they weren't um, actually on teams or playing um, at the time I heard this story. And so if we uh, kind of look at the data, uh, kind of put it into something that may be uh, commonplace or, or uh, something that uh, some folks in the audience are commonly exposed to like professional football, we can get a sense that um, it is likely that there are um, some, some folks out there um, and it just uh, leads us to the question of, um, you know, why, uh, why folks continue um, not to feel comfortable um, having that uh, be a, a, part of their, um, a part of their persona or, or their professional life. A little bit more in terms of data, um, in general, throughout the United States, uh, LGBT persons are uh, more likely to be unemployed, uninsured, food insecure, and um, have lower incomes uh, than non-LGBT folks. If we look at some specific Virginia data, again, this is uh, a couple years old, there's still significant numbers of folks um, who are um, feeling uh, discrimination and experiencing discrimination within the state. Um, and so that becomes, uh, you know, a very real issue as, as we look at uh, these folks in Virginia becoming um, our patients and clients. So um, again, cultural humility, authenticity, respect, those are kind of the, the main take homes. Um, I was in a conversation this morning with my department chair talking about um, a presentation yesterday uh, that was in the School of Medicine related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, talking about uh, how challenging it can be uh, and how important it is to have conversations to, uh, to point out or call out uh, situations uh, when you see them that you don't believe um, are necessarily um, appropriate or in the best interest of our, our patients and our students uh, as well. And um, how important it is to, to really uh, to try. Um, I guess the final take home point would be that um, with this uh, respect uh, for the, the authenticity of each individual and with a, a humble approach uh, regarding the differences in others, it, it's also um, hard to do it completely wrong if, if you truly are entering conversations with, with uh, these three um, uh, 
kind of uh, important um, concepts at the forefront. So what can we do as clinicians, uh, as professionals uh, within uh, our environments? I, I did want to talk about uh, two very specific things that we've done within family medicine within the last two years, uh, and then close with a slide uh, that comes from the internal medicine a national physician group, and then again, hopefully have some times for comments or questions. Um, when I talk about this with the medical students, which I do every year, uh, every year I, I walk away having learned something from the audience. So, uh, so I'm hoping that we can uh, have some, some interchange or exchange, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to, to learn more today too. So one thing we did uh, in our office was we um, have focused on some team training uh, with awareness and sensitivity. So um, I led a, uh, a staff development session for our front desk staff, our nurses, and all of our clinicians, where we really went through kind of a similar um, experience thinking about, um, thinking about the issues of uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, sex, um, gender expression. Uh, and we talked a fair amount about uh, basic stuff uh, like pronouns, uh, like not making assumptions, like asking uh, the questions. We, we talked about how hard it is uh, for some of us to break the habit of saying yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, um, since that's the way we were raised. We were, we were taught to do that. Um, and uh, learning that there are ways without uh, the gender-related identifier to show the same level of courteousness and respect and talking about how to do that. We also, within our department, within the school, we've had some, um, some training about, um, about these topics as well um, that we found uh, to be helpful, um, kind of the, the, the first uh, few steps that we've uh, taken collectively on those teams. The other um, concrete task that we set ourselves for um, within the last year and a half or so was to, to review and update our intake form. So um, as many uh, clinical operations do, we have a, a form that we ask new patients uh, to, uh, to fill out uh, when we're um, engaging with them in our practice and welcoming them into family medicine. And, uh, helping uh, learn about their health and issues related to their health. The initial version of our form that we were using when I first joined the practice and that we continued to use uh, for, for many years um, had these questions on it uh, related to um, sexuality um, and, and, and kind of relationship status. So, and, and this, it was a three page form and, and these were these were the questions that, that we asked. Um, for, for actually many years, uh, a lot of the clinicians felt that we should really um, kind of update this, uh, re-engage uh, and expand um, uh, the, the, the opportunities that we provided patients to tell us about themselves. And it really uh, came to the forefront with the help of two of our students. So there were a couple of medical students who were very interested in this topic as well. Um, we had met and, uh, you know, I said, hey, I could really use some help. Uh, we really need to, to fix this form. And do you guys have any time or interest in kind of helping us do that? Um, and thankfully they said yes. Uh, one of them is, is within the LGBT uh, community as well. And so they did, um, a fair amount of research online, uh, looking at what are some um, other clinics uh, doing, uh, some of the nationally known clinics that focus on uh, GLBG care health, uh, Fenway Health in Boston, Whitman Walker in DC, Howard Brown in Chicago, um, came up with some uh, examples, compiled uh, what we thought were the best, and then we uh, ran it through multiple versions of editing uh, with clinicians, with uh, our team members, including social work and nursing front desk. And our current form um, provides uh, three different places where our patients have the opportunity to talk to us about uh, sex, sexuality, and relationship-related issues that uh, may be important to them. Um, 
we do have the caveat. Um, uh, there is a kind of a welcome cover letter that says if there's anything you'd prefer not answer, not to answer, don't feel comfortable with, please just leave that blank and move on. Um, and we asked them on page one about pronouns and name used uh, in addition to uh, legal name uh, and sex for uh, documentation billing purposes. Um, on the demographic page, we've expanded uh, to ask about gender, sex assigned at birth, uh, transgender, uh, transsexual status, sexuality. And then uh, later in the, in the form, we have uh, a much more um, expanded sexual history, sexual health um, questionnaire. Uh, we found that some patients do choose to leave this blank. Uh, most fill it out um, and um, our uh, clinicians, not unanimously, uh, but the vast majority of them have felt that uh, this form has been an improvement in helping uh, their patients have an opportunity to communicate uh, some sensitive information and in giving them uh, more information that is relevant to uh, healthcare, uh, whether it's uh, health promotion, disease prevention, vaccinations. Um, it uh, has been, uh, uh, in general, uh, a very positively received uh, change. So when it comes to the American College of Physicians, they are the largest group of internal medicine physicians and they put out a position statement uh, with respect to uh, helping achieve equity in healthcare for GLBT individuals, LGBT individuals. And these were basically their nine uh, recommendations. I paraphrased um, uh, what they had said, uh, but they stressed including uh, gender identity and anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policies including uh, comprehensive transgender healthcare services in healthcare plans, uh, employing an inclusive definition of family that does not rely on uh, officially uh, recognized uh, statuses such as marriage or biological relations. Uh, they stressed the importance of having healthcare facilities allow patients to uh, self-determine who can visit and who can act on their behalf they espouse support for uh, civil marriage for same-sex couples in addition to uh, continued work on data collection and research related to uh, the LGBT community and the social determinants of health impacting those, uh, the members of that community and, and how best to help. Uh, they stressed incorporating LGBT health issues into professional school, health profession school curricula. They um, stated their opposition to conversion or reparative uh, therapies and uh, support, supported the continued reviews of uh, MSM as men who have sex with men of the blood donation deferral policies um, affecting that uh, cohort of persons. And I apologize for messing up the slides so much. Um, this is actually my last slide. So I'm gonna um, say thank you. I, I wanted to be able to, to cut the presentation maybe a little bit short in, in case there were questions or, or, um, or comments. I appreciate uh, the chance to be here. I appreciate the time and I uh, greatly appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Crossman. Uh, we just greatly appreciate um, the robust uh, presentation. It was very informative, very, very educational. I know just anecdotally here at the School of Ministry, I'm primarily a clinical faculty and in our clinic floor um, where our third and fourth year students are primarily housed, we have a lot of um, transgender patients. I think more than maybe perhaps people um, consider or think. Um, and so um, any kind of discussion around hormone replacement um, therapy or things that are possible interactions from a medical perspective that we should be thinking about for the oral cavity and, and that sort of thing at all? Sure. Um, so uh, when it comes to um, what you said, I've, I've found that as well, uh, there is a, a larger transgender community with adults here uh, than I had expected. Uh, two or three years ago, um, 
met collaboratively with the folks at Shore and other folks in the community and realized that there's a, a huge need for um, medical care for the transgender population. And so we started within family medicine um, and a transgender uh, um, healthcare uh, service line, uh, so to speak. We have uh, three family physicians um, now that have been uh, trained in providing gender affirming hormone therapy. In general, uh, with our transgender patients, we are uh, treating hormonally when indicated to um, kind of match uh, the hormone levels with the gender identity, right? So um, in terms of uh, long-term complications or consequences of, of this therapy, uh, we still are in need of more research. We don't have a ton of data, but in terms of short-term, uh, we're really looking at treating um, a, a transgender woman with um, hormones to get uh, her system into the appropriate physiologic state, physiologic level of hormones, not supra-physiologic. So in general, um, there should be minimal interactions um, and uh, hopefully minimal complications um, if uh, you know, they're, they're being treated with uh, prescribed meds uh, that are um, you know, monitored and, and followed. So there's nothing uh, specific uh, that should lead to uh, extra concern um, or complications uh, related to cross-sex cross uh, hormone therapy. Um, we do use uh, spironolactone, which is an antihypertensive. Uh, it's also a testosterone blocker, testosterone blocker in our trans feminine patients. Um, but the blood pressure effects uh, when it's used in, in this situation tend to be minimal. Um, occasionally some effect on the electrolytes. Um, yeah, so I, I would um, encourage folks to feel uh, very comfortable, um, you know, providing the full scope of, of treatment to, uh, to trans patients who are on uh, gender affirming hormones. Awesome, thank you so much for that. So we do have one question that has appeared in the Q&A. Um, I believe it's from someone in private practice. Um, and so uh, that person's saying, I do not create the forms that my office uses, nor do I have the opportunity to do so, but they do not include a section um, in reference to preferred pronouns. When there is a patient who is um, maybe sort of aesthetically ambiguous, what is the best way to address them? I don't want to offend them by making it clear I can't readily identify their gender, but I also don't want to make them uncomfortable by using the wrong pronoun. Right. So um, this is a, um, a great question and it's, it's not always easy. And uh, I think the main thing is again, uh, to, to try and there's, there's a couple of different suggestions uh, potentially. So one is um, getting into the habit um, of more commonly introducing yourself with your pronouns. Um, so, so for instance, um, I would, you know, potentially walk in, uh, get my initial visual cue and, and I might say, hi, hey, I'm Steve Crossman. I'm one of the doctors. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and, you know, uh, in non-COVID times, maybe, maybe offer a hand for a handshake uh, in COVID times, you know, maybe not do that. But uh, that sets the stage that uh, you're more than willing, ready, receptive, uh, to kind of hear that um, and it kind of normalizes the exchange of pronouns in the, in the typical introduction. Um, you can also uh, follow that directly with, you know, tell me a little bit about you, what are your pronouns? Um, so uh, I found that, um, and I, I've, I've sometimes done these uh, workshops with uh, a trans colleague uh, as well, uh, co-presenting, and uh, he uh, refers um, kind of to the um, the setting the stage piece and the respect piece and the um, the general sense that many trans people have been um, unfortunately so poorly treated that anything 
that is done, whether it's the front desk or the form or the nurse or the clinician or the hygienist or the tech, anything that's done to recognize um, the non-binary or the, the non-traditional um, uh, is really welcome. And so um, I certainly have fumbled it um, more times than I've sailed through smoothly, uh, but trying, um, asking for pronouns, uh, offering your pronouns, um, and then just um, sincerely apologizing uh, if, if, if you mess it up, um, which, um, you know, is, is likely to happen, unfortunately. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but that's probably be where I'd start. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions from um, attendees at all? You can put it in the chat or you can put it in the Q&A. Um, I think one of the things that I'm really excited that has um, kind of come from the entire week, my background is in, a, in, in addition to being a clinician, I also have a background in ethics. And so I think that uh, that respect piece, that humanity piece, we are providers of healthcare, irrespective of a myriad of differences that, that patients bring um, into our operatory. Um, what do you say maybe to providers that um, have a difficult time uh, separating out kind of whatever their kind of beliefs and mentality are versus I wanna treat this patient with the utmost respect, despite maybe my own political leanings or, or whatever, um, maybe how would you offer encouragement to that provider that's kind of struggling with that, that, that tension, if you will? Sure, and, and I think that um, we all experience that tension somewhere at some time. Um, I, I think that the, the first step um, is trying to make those implicit biases explicit in your own head. Um, and, and oftentimes this is something that requires uh, very trusting relationships with a coworker, family, uh, staff, uh, because by definition, if it's something that's implicit, we're, we're not necessarily thinking about it um, um, explicitly. But um, knowing, uh, knowing yourself, knowing where uh, your values and beliefs um, are, are uh, very strong, um, encouraging yourself to um, be around different people, uh, be around folks uh, in situations that are other than you, uh, practicing being comfortable in those settings, um, remembering that um, we do as healthcare providers um, take various oaths and have um, various obligations to care for people, um, period. Um, however, uh, recognizing that um, there, there may be other clinicians um, who are more comfortable or, or who have more expertise. And uh, I think that um, having that um, collection of names and phone numbers in your back pocket can also be helpful if, if there is a situation where um, you feel uh, the conflict uh, to the point of discomfort and uh, to the point where it's, it's um, hard to be certain uh, that the patient is getting the best possible services then um, having, having those connections and those uh, referral options in place. Uh, I guess that, that kind of would be, um, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, and uh, we do have, uh, I think the responsibility to, to think about it and uh, talk closely with folks who know you and, um, and those who don't, but with those who know you help ask the questions. Um, uh, do you think I'm showing some bias here or might there be uh, some bias that I have that maybe I haven't recognized and, and um, kind of go from there? Awesome, thank you. Um, I think one other thought um, that has presented itself this week is kind of the connection between 
uh, principles, values around diversity, equity, inclusion, and how they intersect with um, provider well-being and provider uh, resilience and kind of our mental um, state as clinicians or as students that are in the health professions. Um, so while I know this talk has mostly been focused on how we care for patients that identify in varying ways, um, I can't help but think through the fact that certainly in this wave where this is more readily talked about and discussed, um, have you seen best practices or um, around helping students that potentially identify particularly transgender or the ones that we're not quite as comfortable discussing, um, you know, or colleagues as well. Um, have you seen maybe best practices around helping those individuals feel seen or safe or um, valued in the um, in the medical school space? So, um, I, I think that um, I have seen. Uh, lots of good work. So um, you, you may know Dr. Kevin Harris is our um, founding interim dean uh, for diversity, inclusion, um, and equity in the School of Medicine. And uh, even before his appointment, there's been um, serious effort at uh, focusing on the learning climate. Um, and that has kind of uh, intensified of late um, the School of Medicine has been um, very focused on um, minimizing student mistreatment, um, you know, obviously with the goal of uh, eliminating it. Uh, and so every year there are uh, questionnaires and surveys that go out. And um, when it comes to best practices, I, I'm not a, I'm not a hundred percent sure that we've um, nail those yet. And, and if you guys have some in, in dentistry that you can share, that'd be awesome. Uh, but the, the effort certainly is there. Um, and it, you're right, it, it's, it's a big picture, right? So if you have, um, and I'll use the, the medical um, example, but if you have physicians who are um, feeling uh, morally injured or uh, burned out, then it's a heavier lift. Uh, for them to, um, you know, have the most ideal learning climate for their students. So it really does come down to um, a, a holistic approach a, across the, the, the enterprise. I think with our students, um, making sure that they know that they are safe to report instances and making sure that they have multiple avenues so whether it's the curriculum office or um, the department leadership in the department where, um, where the issue occurred um, or um, uh, the professionalism committee. Or, so there's making sure that students are aware um, and have multiple options for reporting and support and uh, making sure uh, that uh, the reports are are addressed, taken seriously, and um, um, you know, acted upon. I think those are uh, some of the practices that we've put in place that that I think are important and I think are helping. Um, you know, the the other folk, the other emphasis really has to be on uh, the diversity of our workforce. So having having the opportunity for a student to see a faculty member who looks, sounds, dresses, talks, something, something like they do, having, having yeah. some of that um, visible uh, sharing um, that can occur is important. So Dean Buckley is, has been very um, steadfast in his commitment to um, enhancing and increasing the diversity of the student body and the, the faculty and, and certainly his leadership there is going to help um, significantly as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I think the one last question that we had come over um, is if you have a recommended source for where folks can see like sample forms, medical history forms, 
is are there organizations that you point to um, for folks to look at at those kinds of things? Sure, um, I'm more than happy to share the one that we have. I, I'm not saying it's the best, even even reviewing it again and preparing the the cut and paste pictures for this. I'm thinking, sure. ah, maybe we'll need to update that. Um, so I'm I'm happy to share ours. If anyone wants, they can uh, find me through the VC or VCU Health emails. Um, in terms of GLBT um, information, uh, probably the place that I go the most is uh, Finway, Finway Institute, uh, Finway Health Center in Boston. They have uh, within Finway the national, oh my goodness, is it the National LGBT Education Center? I can't remember the, the sure. details, uh, but that's, uh, they have um, amazing uh, modules and training and examples and downloads uh, specific to um, LGBT folks. Um, I haven't spent much time on the Whitman Walker website. I imagine they have them as well. And then um, Howard Brown is in Chicago, Howard Brown Health Center, it also focuses. If we're specifically talking about uh, transgender, then uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco has a center of excellence and also um, WPATH. So the World Proceedings for Advancing Transgender, I'm sorry, I can't remember what the oh, acronym okay. is yeah. for, but it's WPATH and okay. they have uh, standards that um, internationally have been reviewed um, with respect to um, caring for uh, transgender persons um, and they have some other stuff. If you want just some basic patient education handouts, I think that GLMA, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, glma.org, they have uh, some really uh, kind of um, patient-friendly uh, materials. Um, and they also have some clinician um, directed materials as well available on their website. Awesome, I just put um, a couple of those in the chat so that folks could directly um, find those kinds of things if um, that's what they're looking for as well. I also wanted to just share, um, I, di I did when I was kind of preparing for this topic, I did actually stumble across an article that was um, written by one of our alum from the School of Dentistry um, who is a pediatric um, dentist in Virginia Beach now, but he did his residency at Cincinnati um, and did a study where they did some focus groups with adolescent transgender patients and their oral health experiences. So I just shared that in the chat as well um, for people to begin to check out that's um, a little more dental specific. But we just want to thank you so much, Dr. Crossman, for taking the time to share with us and being vulnerable and um, it was so educational from top to bottom, but particularly those early slides, just I think helping people with definitions and acronyms and, you know, as um, these issues are continually evolving kind of almost daily in many regards. I think that was super helpful for us. Um, so thank you so much for that. Thank you for, I know it takes a lot of time to put these presentations together. So thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you for all the attendees that signed on this week. Um, and this has been a great week. Hopefully, I guess I'm biased because I organized it, but um, tomorrow we're gonna end with our keynote, which is a, um, a co-sponsored program from the School of Medicine and our entire health science campus, where we'll be looking at discrimination, particularly around um, civil rights protections and hair discrimination. So we have an attorney that's gonna be um, ending us off tomorrow, but thank you so much, Dr. Crossman. Everyone have a great afternoon um, and thanks for joining us. Very welcome, thank you.